Good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thank you for joining us. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will lead a remembrance service at Canterbury Cathedral this morning following the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Prince Charles has led the royal family in thanking the public for its support, saying Prince Philip would have been touched by the outpouring of feeling in recent days. Meanwhile, Buckingham Palace has said the Duke's funeral will take place on Saturday at Windsor Castle in a service modified to comply with coronavirus restrictions. Our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, reports. They are a family in mourning, grieving the loss of a husband, father and grandfather, stepping in where the Duke would once have been supporting the monarch. The first official public tribute coming from his eldest son. I, uh, I particularly wanted to say that uh, my father, oh, I suppose the last uh, 70 years, has given the most remarkable, devoted service uh, to the Queen, to my family, and uh, to the country, and also to the whole of the Commonwealth. And as you can imagine, uh, my family and I miss my father enormously. He was a, a much-loved and appreciated figure. My dear papa was, uh, was a very special person who I think above all else would have been amazed by the reaction and the touching things that have been said about him. And from that point of view, we are, my family, deeply grateful for all that. It will sustain us in this particular loss and at this particularly sad time. Thank you. Thank you. As crowds gathered outside Windsor Castle, where Prince Philip died on Friday morning, other members of the family were visiting the Queen. Their son, Prince Andrew, driving himself past the well-wishers. In a separate car, Prince Edward and the Countess of Wessex drove slowly, thanking those who'd come to pay their respects. Sophie, with tears in her eyes, telling us Her Majesty was doing OK. He never wanted the pomp and ceremony that his national service meant he was entitled to. In the end, the pandemic, the reason his funeral plans had been significantly scaled back. The funeral will take place at Windsor Castle next Saturday at three o'clock. There'll be no public access or public processions and the event will be within the current COVID guidelines but still very much reflect the personal wishes of the Duke. There will be a national minute silence at three o'clock. So even without COVID, I think we would have had a scaled down uh, funeral. But clearly now this is going to be very small. It's going to be in line with COVID regulations of below 30. Um, and it will be essentially a ceremonial. It will be a sort of commemoration of uh, Philip's life, but not the great international event that it would otherwise have been. We are still waiting for the full guest list, but his children and grandchildren are expected to attend, including the Duke of Sussex. But Meghan, who's expecting her second child, will not because of doctor's advice. Windsor has played host to so many big royal events over the years, and usually these streets be packed with tens of thousands of people. But next weekend, all of the events surrounding the funeral will take place behind the castle walls. Yes, there will be a procession and there will be a large military presence, but we're all being encouraged to watch it from our own homes. In recent years since he retired, the Queen's official duties meant they had spent time apart, the pandemic bringing them back together at Windsor. The family have always described themselves as her supporting cast. Their comfort never needed more as they prepared to give the Duke of Edinburgh a fitting farewell. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News, at Windsor Castle. Well, I'm joined now by the Royal Editor of the Daily Mirror, Russell Myers. Good morning to you. Uh, we know now that the funeral will be next Saturday, but before that, a remembrance service to be held at Canterbury Cathedral this morning. Good morning, Gillian. Uh, we do, and there's more details of the funeral coming out yesterday. And, uh, you know, I dare say a, a bit of lightheartedness in, in the, the doom. I think it was a beautiful tribute by uh, Prince Charles. He was speaking 
of how the family were incredibly touched by all the well wishes throughout the not only the country but the world. I think they've been absolutely uh, shocked at the outpouring of emotion. Uh, but also, you know, small incredible details like uh, Prince Philip had designed his own Land Rover to transport his coffin, which was part of the original plans for his funeral. And obviously, they have been scaled back massively and had to be signed off by the Queen um, very, very sh uh, short notice. But um, I think it'll be small details like that that will be in keeping with his wishes. He wouldn't have wanted a fuss and, uh, and still, as the Palace say, it will be in line with his wishes and it will be a tremendous send-off. Yes, we know that he, he didn't want a, a big affair and, and there won't be any public access or, or processions, the uh, Palace are advising people to, to stay away. No, I, I think, think that's right. And, and they were very, very conscious, acutely aware, I was told, of how um, many people really did want to pay their respects. However, we are still in a, a lockdown situation. Obviously, things are going to change tomorrow. However, they, uh, they have people's safety in mind and they ha were it, it, discouraging people from gathering at the uh, Royal Palaces, Buckingham Palace, even a Ho Holyrood House and, uh, and Windsor Castle, and to instead of leaving flowers at these locations, to perhaps think of uh, a charity donation that you may wish to make yourself, or indeed one of the many, many charities and organisations that uh, the Duke of Edinburgh had an affiliation with. We're, we're waiting for the full guest list, but we, we do know that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has uh, given up his place so that a, a member of the royal family can attend instead of him. Yes, indeed. and. Um, Number 10 said yesterday that uh, Boris Johnson was, uh, again, uh, very aware that this was a, a family in mourning. The restrictions on pl uh, in, in place with any funeral going ahead at the moment means only 30 members can attend. And certainly the Queen will be going through that list um, as we speak in the coming days to try and whistle it down. I mean, there would have been so many people, not only just in the wider family, but uh, again, in the many, many associations and uh, uh, patronages that he held that would have wanted to pay their respects. But it is a very, very different situation. And um, it, uh, it will be televised and people are advised to sort of remember the Duke of Edinburgh in their own way from home in the, in the, in the safety of their own home. Uh, and one of those... Uh, uh to be in attendance, almost certainly, uh, Prince Harry returning from America. Yes, confirmed yesterday. I mean, it was uh, the last couple of days it's been uh, rumoured, but confirmed by the palace yesterday that the Duke of Sussex will be returning for his grandfather's funeral. And no doubt this will um, be fraught with tension. It's, uh, it's not uh, too long since the Oprah Winfrey interview. He hasn't seen any of his family since around the, uh, the, um, the early March last year, just days before... The, the national lockdown. Um, Meghan won't be coming. She's, of course, he heavily pregnant with their second child, and we understand had been advised by her doctors not to make the journey from, from California. But um, one would hope that the family can put their differences aside. No doubt those issues are still very, very raw of the, uh, the issues raised in the Oprah Winfrey interview, accusing the royal family of, uh, of racism, of abandonment, when Meghan was having issues when she was pregnant with their son Archie. But uh, again, this is, a, this is a family united in grief, I think, um, is what all sides are saying. And, uh, and one will wish them that they can put their differences aside, especially for this occasion. Uh, we know that according to the Queen's wishes, there'll be two weeks of royal mourning starting from yesterday. What exactly will that entail? Well, engagement still can go ahead. I'm not too sure. that there, there are a couple of engagements in the diary over the next week, um, and there is no confirmation whether they will go ahead. Um, there, there isn't any protocol to say that they, they shouldn't... Um, you know, go ahead, and, 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 and people will want to see the family out and about. So I think that in, in your package there, you saw Prince Charles um, speaking so eloquently about his father, uh, the Countess of Wessex as well, looking teary-eyed, that she is no doubt supporting the Queen, saying that the Queen had been amazing. But um, I do think that we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps see more statements from the, the royal family over the coming days, because they are very, very aware that people want to remember the Duke of Edinburgh and, um, and really share in their grief to, to, to remember a remarkable man who had a remarkable, remarkable life and, uh, and royal career. Russell Myers, thank you very much for speaking to us, Royal Editor at The Daily Mail. Thank you. Retailers across England are hoping that pent-up demand will bring people flooding back to the shops tomorrow after a year of closures and restrictions. But with a number of measures still in place, there's no guarantee that shops and restaurants will bounce back. 
Our home editor, Jason Fowle, has been to Covent Garden in the heart of London to see preparations for reopening. Will Monday mark the beginning of the recovery? Covent Garden's gearing up for when restaurants can serve outside and non-essential shops reopen. Do you worry that the world has gone online and it will never get back to what it was? Not, not at all. Covent Garden's been around for 500 years. We're very confident it'll be around for a very long time. I think both of those things can coexist. And every time we've had a lockdown and we've had an easing of lockdown, what we've seen is restaurants full, shops full, queues to get in, people wanting to come out, connect with each other at a very, very human level, but also experience the best of London. For many, the pandemic hit home with these images of London emptying out just before the first lockdown in March 2020. How could the bustle of 44 million visitors a year to Covent Garden just vanish? Back then, traders at Jubilee Market hoped it would be a brief shutdown. You've been here since 78 as well. Yeah. Yeah. But a year on, and the market's not ready to open, because last summer, they didn't have the trade. When we did come back, the market was absolutely desolate. The West End was desolate. Yeah. But we were especially quiet because we depend on tourists, both domestic and foreign, and obviously there was no foreign tourists. There's no museums to go to, there's no theatres to go to. It, it, so every... there's no point in you opening your business until... No, until there's a reasonable reopen. footfall. Over the course of 2020, the valuation of the Covent Garden estate has plunged by a quarter. The landlord has had to restructure leases and waive rent from struggling tenants. And only the hardiest kept going, like the florist who began trading shrubs to become a garden centre. The Waldorf and the Savoy, they're not opening until the 17th of May. Yeah. So if there's nobody staying here, and there's certainly no theatres, I think it's going to take a lot longer than people realise to, to come, especially in uh, central London. Look at the streets here. It's empty. The only people walking around, unbelievably, are traffic wardens, when there's no <laughs> cars and there's no people. <laughs> This is a place where time has stood still, where livelihoods have been put on hold, but now you can just start to feel it. The buzz is returning. London is getting ready to put on a show. But the question is, who's coming? This place can't thrive, can it, really? I, until I, I the airports are open and the hotels are open and the theatres are open. I think it's a really good point. You do need a lot of things to work together. I think we have to remember that, you know, somewhere like Covent Garden, it's both for the international tourists, but it's also for the Londoner, it's for the domestic audience. It's a slow, phased, uncertain coming back to life. On Monday, the piazza will have 800 seats, heaters and umbrellas, food, alcohol, and hopefully lots of people. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Almost 7 million people have now received two coronavirus vaccinations in the UK. The latest COVID figures show 2,589 new cases were reported in the most recent 24-hour period, with 40 more deaths across the UK. That takes the total number of people who've died to 127,080. The figures also show that more than 32 million people have now had their first vaccine dose. David Cameron told a senior number 10 advisor it would be nuts to exclude a company he was working for from a coronavirus loan scheme, according to an email published today by the Sunday Times. The newspaper also reports the former Prime Minister took his boss, financier Lex Greensill, for a private drink with the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, to discuss a payment scheme which was later rolled out in the NHS. Our political correspondent Rob Powell is in Westminster for us now. Rob, what's the uh, detail behind this uh, very latest allegations then? So these are more um, allegations published by the Sunday Times, which essentially detail um, the extent um, of lobbying that former Prime Minister David Cameron is thought to have engaged in um, on behalf of a financial services firm, Greensill Capital, that he went on to work for after he left Downing Street. Now, the Sunday Times um, has published a lengthy email which they say David Cameron sent to a senior number 10 um, advisor last year after the Treasury had already rejected an application from the firm um, for access to a COVID loan scheme. Now, I think what's striking um, reading this email um, is really the tone of it and the amount of pressure that David Cameron 
um, appears to be trying to put on um, officials to allow this company um, into uh, the mix on this. Uh, now, the email reads that it says it seems nuts to exclude the type of firm uh, such as Greensill Capital from this scheme and that what we need to do is find a way for Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, uh, to have a good look at this and ask officials to find a way of making it work. Now, this of course comes after David Cameron sent text messages to Rishi Sunak's personal phone, um, pressing the case for this firm to be involved and also lobbied other Treasury ministers um, as well. Now, separately, the Sunday Times also reports um, on a, a private drink which David Cameron had with Matt Hancock alongside Lex Greensill, the person that ran this financial services company, to discuss um, a payment scheme that was later rolled out in the NHS. Now, we haven't heard anything from David Cameron on any of these accusations right from the beginning when they started to unfold. But Number 10 has said overnight that during the pandemic, they were approached by an immense number of companies to discuss the response um, and the various emails were passed on to the relevant departments. Now, clearly, this is leading to calls for more transparency when it comes um, to lobbying, especially as David Cameron was found to have acted within the guidelines because he was an employee of this company. Remember, it was 2010 that David Cameron said that lobbying was going to be the next big scandal. I don't think he quite had this in mind when he said that, though. Indeed. Rob, thank you. The Caribbean island of St Vincent has been blanketed in a layer of ash following the spectacular eruption of a volcano on the island. More than 3,000 people have been put up in shelters, with around 16,000 told to evacuate their homes. In 1902, more than 1,000 people died when the volcano erupted, but this time there have been no injuries or deaths reported. Sadia Chowdhury reports. Hard to believe these are daytime pictures. The air dense with thick ash falling from the sky. You can still hear the volcano's rumble. La Soufrière volcano erupted spectacularly on Friday, pumping clouds of ash six miles into the air. I can hear the rumblings. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Those who lived too close were ordered to evacuate. Some took shelter at a school where Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez offered comfort. We don't know how much more is going to come out, but it is venting. It's coming out. So far, we have done well in that nobody gets injured. Sean, come out of you. Nobody is dead. Ash clouds almost completely cover the tiny island of St. Vincent. Its population of 100,000 largely tucked away inside. And on the ground, just look at these footprints. Not snow, but in ash. See, we are agricultural um, based community. The disaster response team warned this could go on until July or August. Difficult months ahead for the farming and agriculture sectors. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. Time now to take a look at the morning's other main stories for you now. And a 34-year-old man has been charged with the murder of the millionaire hotelier Sir Richard Sutton. The 83-year-old died on Wednesday during an incident at a property near Gillingham in Dorset. Thomas Schreiber from Gillingham has been charged with murder, attempted murder and dangerous driving and is due before magistrates in Poole tomorrow. A woman in her 60s named in report as Sir Richard's wife remains in a critical condition in hospital. One of the stars of Big Brother, Nikki Graham, has died aged 38 following a long battle with anorexia. She'd recently checked into a private hospital to treat her eating disorder after a fundraising campaign organised by friends and fans. And if you've been affected by any issues mentioned there, you can get in touch with Beat Eating Disorders on 0808 201 1677, the number on the bottom of the screen for you. It's time now for a look at the weather with Joe. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
Good morning to you. Well, the weather looks like settling down through the coming week and temperatures recovering, if not to uh, average for the time of year, perhaps a little above. But right at the moment, it's still quite wintry. We've got wintry showers around north-facing coasts and we'll see a few of those appearing inland through the course of the day. Early warnings still out for snow and ice, running from Greater Manchester across to parts of Yorkshire and northeastern parts of England. Very, very cold start. Temperatures sub-zero, as low as minus seven, minus eight over parts of Scotland. We'll see the cloud bubbling up through the day and a few showers appearing. And again, these are likely to be wintry up over the higher ground. Into this evening and overnight, we're watching this area of showery activity coming down through parts of Wales, the southwest. Again, we could see some winteriness over the higher ground, clearer to the northeast. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Welcome back to Sky News Breakfast. Let's take a look at the front pages of the morning's newspapers for you now. And as well as showing father and son smiling broadly at each other, the Telegraph quotes Prince Charles's tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh. My dear papa was a very special person. I miss him enormously. The Express has a similar headline and says the nation will fall silent at 3 p.m. next Saturday for the Duke's funeral. The Mail on Sunday also carries Prince Charles's praise for his father, describing his remarkable and devoted service to the Queen and the country. The Sunday Times reports that given coronavirus restrictions, the Prime Minister will give up his seat at the funeral to allow another family member to attend. The Mirror highlights what will be a reunion for Princes William and Harry. Its headline, United in Grief. With a quip the Duke might have enjoyed, the people remarks on the vehicle which will carry the Duke's coffin, declaring land, rover and out. And given Prince Philip was the Duke of Edinburgh, Scotland on Sunday pictures the 41-gun salute held in his honour at the city's famous castle. In other news, the Observer reports that scientists are concerned that regional COVID-19 hotspots in the UK, such as West Yorkshire and the Black Country, could bring about a third wave. And reacting to Rachel Blackmore becoming the first female jockey ever to win the Grand National, with lots of money backing her, the star asked bookies, why the long face? Let's take a look at the weather for you now with Jo. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, it's a bit chilly this morning, but it's lovely to see some sunshine and much of the country is. There are still a few showers around and those that are there are still on the wintry side, particularly those that are on exposed northern coasts. Now, through the day, we'll find the uh, cloud bubbling up at times and we will see some showers developing more widely. Some of these still wintry, particularly over parts of the Pennines. And uh, certainly early this morning, we've got showers in parts of the Greater Manchester area across into parts of Yorkshire and northeastern England. So in terms of uh, temperatures, still not on the high side, six to nine degrees Celsius. We might just squeeze a 10 or 11 here or there. But certainly through the latter part of the day, all eyes up towards the northwest where we see these showers coming in across parts of Northern Ireland. And these are going to spread their way down into parts of Wales, the Midlands, down towards the southeast overnight. And again, this could, there could be some winteriness in these over the higher ground. But we set up this northeast southwest divide, clear skies to the north and east, so another widespread frost for tomorrow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Welcome back with us now to take us through the newspapers. The editor of the Sunday Express, Michael Booker, and the broadcaster, and Diamond. Welcome back to both of you. Uh, starting with the mail, first of all. Uh, Michael, you've had a look. Actually, no, we're going to start with the Times. Uh, and this is a story about the, the triumph of the outsider, uh, talking about uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. And actually, what a, a difficult childhood he had and how difficult it was made for him when he, he married the Queen by the, the, the courtiers. Well, I know, and this this piece, largely written by Max Hastings, uh, goes into it in a really interesting way because over the years, just more recently, we've talked about how difficult it is for any outsider to marry into the royal family. Uh, we look at, you know, from Diana to Meghan, um, and yet um, Prince Philip did it first. 
Um, and he did it with such a plomb. And here we are paying tribute to a man who clearly did it so successfully. We've seen him as the head of the family um, and somebody who steered that family through some of the most tumultuous years you can imagine. And yet, yes, he, he was uh, the great, great, great grandson of Queen Victoria. And yet through uh, his own particular royal circumstances, ended up being born uh, on a kitchen table in Corfu. Um, his, he was almost brought up as an orphan because his parents separated. His very unhappy Prince uh, Andrew, father, um, led a very sad life in Monte Carlo, having been condemned to death in absentia uh, by a Greek revolutionary court. His mother, Princess Alice, uh, was sent to a sanatorium suffering what they called was paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and he didn't even get a birthday card from her for 15 years. Um, and he was just pushed around from pillar to post right throughout his childhood, his, his um, education being paid for by various relatives. Um, and it was only really because he ended up in the Naval College at Dartmouth and started to make a career for himself that that was when he mixed in those particular circles because he was a royal um, and bumped into Princess Elizabeth, who fell in love with him. Um, and that spelt out the rest of his life. But yeah, I mean, we talk about how difficult it is for people to enter the royal family. Well, he did it first, and over these many, many years, 73 years of marriage, he, has, he made such a go of it, and we're paying tribute to the, to the enormous way he did it now. Yeah, and it, it was no small task. I mean, it was a real struggle. There were many decisions that were taken over his head. One thinks of the, the particular battle to keep his, his family's name. I mean, that was a, a big deal oh, back yeah. then. In fact, Max Hastings makes the point, he says there were rough passages in their relationship, as in all marriages, um, but the Queen and the throne have profited mightily from the fact that Prince Philip was, above all else, a strong man. Princess Elizabeth married, had, had she married a cipher, as some of the courtiers really wanted, such a husband could not have provided the support she has needed amidst all the supreme loneliness that her pomp and circumstance impose and while uh, and that's very true and you can't help thinking today of whether the supreme loneliness will land back on her shoulders again get quite upset thinking about it really because mm. they were together such a long time yeah it is good quite emotional and the, the male making the, the point that the, the queen also is a a very strong woman uh, quoting sophie um duchess of countess of wessex uh, saying that the queen's amazing she actually spoke to us Yesterday, our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, at uh, Windsor, but the Queen surrounded by uh, a group of, of very strong women, according to the Mail. Mike? Yeah, that line, uh, and that brief exchange between Rhiannon Mills and uh, Sophie could have, I mean, without Charles coming out yesterday, that could have been leading a lot of newspapers this morning. It's taken a little bit of a backseat after Charles came out, but it was a fascinating insight into what these women who are around her think of the Queen and the inspiration that they get from the Queen because, you know, at this time you could see the emotion uh, on the Countess of Wessex's face yesterday when she spoke to Sky, and uh, how much it's affected her. But you get the impression and reading around it's the Queen that's been the strong one throughout this. She is the strong one at the moment. She has this, it says, gang of four women particularly around her. We've got the Countess of Wessex, we've got Lady Pamela Hicks, uh, we've got Angela Kelly, her dresser, and we've got Princess Anne as well, and all of these strong women all around her, giving her the support she needs. It also reflects the fact that she recently got two new dogs as well. They've been a comfort during the last few weeks as she's seen uh, Philip uh, uh, fade slightly. Uh, and it's it, it, as, as he's um, now passed away, she has the, the two dogs to keep her company with the women. These dogs, Mick and Fergus, uh, they're called are going to help give us some of this support. But I think the key thing for the nation is that the, the uh, Queen is getting this great support. We also saw uh, Prince Edward and uh, Prince Andrew go in to speak to her yesterday. Charles has already been in there as well. Uh, the, the, clearly, there's people rallying around. Over the next few days, we may see the grandchildren also go in to see her. But she has got this great support network. And it'll be just fascinating to, for when the nation next gets to 
glimpse her to see how she's doing. But clearly over the last few weeks when we have seen her doing her engagements, and again, she's had in the back of the mind what's been happening with Philip and the condition he was in, but she seemed to be as cheerful as ever and going about her business as ever. And I think... You know, once we get the emotional, uh, uh, powerful funeral out of the way, she will try and be back to business as usual and how we know it. Yes, but, but she will have been hit. I mean, this is a, a long-term life partner, consort, uh, you know, the shoulder to lean on, so uh, it will have a, a tremendous effect. Uh, and more details of the, the character of the Duke in the Express. Uh, we know that he was very modest, but he really had no reason to be such a, a courageous war hero, Anne. Yes, that's right. And I, I think it is worth reminding everybody of the fact that he um, he served this country uh, and he fought the enemy very gallantly. And he was mentioned in dispatches, as they say. Um, in 19, That was in 1941. Apparently, he was mentioned in dispatches um, after spotting an unexpected enemy vessel with his searchlights. Um, and that was all written down as being particularly courageous and thoughtful. Um, but he really showed his initiative a bit later on in the war in 1943 when he was only 21, serving on board HMS Wallace, they were being bombed by incoming uh, aircraft. And there's no doubt they were going to be toast. And he had this idea of actually floating a raft full of, of rubbish, floating a raft out, setting fire to it, so that the incoming planes would actually be fooled into thinking that they'd already bombed the ship, they'd got the ship. Um, and uh, it succeeded. And apparently, um, his quick thinking, because he only had 20 minutes to come up with the idea before the plane came round again and had another go at them, um, that quick thinking saved many lives that night. Um, and so everybody who served with him said, you know, that was the sort of initiative and courage that he had uh, as an only only a 21 year old fighting for this country in the war and I just think that's sometimes just worth reminding people especially a generation who think of him as a very old man indeed you know once upon a time he wasn't he was younger he was extraordinarily good-looking young man and um, and he did his bit he really did fight for this country Yes, to have the presence of mind at 21 to, to come up with a, that decoy, simply uh, amazing. Michael, tell us who the Earl of Baldwin was. Well, again, it was one of uh, it was one of the his, his jokes, uh, one of his uh, quick witticisms that uh, he's been uh, we we got to know and love over the years. But this is from quite an early age, and it showed, uh, according to the headmaster at Gordonston, uh, they just showed you how uh, tired and how he saw through uh, royalty fairly quickly. Even though he was a young prince himself, he was a bit of a celebrity at school, and people sometimes came up to him and asked for his autograph. Uh, and he, he found it a bit tiresome already, so sometimes he'd sign. Uh, uh, for some bemused autograph hunters uh, with the name the Earl of Baldwin rather than uh, a, a prince uh, instead. So, again, the headmaster, Kurt Hahn, uh, was uh, quoted at the time saying that he was already tired of, uh, of, of royalty and princedom even at that time and didn't see it as uh, something that was particularly attached to him and he wanted to be his own man and it showed one, the quick wit and one, that he had his own mind from a fairly early age. Another one of his witticisms that uh, that jumped out at me today as well. There's another one from a, a photographer who was stood outside Balmoral one day and he came out, did uh, the Duke in his Land Rover and said, look, be a good chap and clear off. Although I don't think he said quite clear off, but we'll say clear <laughs> off uh, for television. So 90 minutes later, the Duke drove back. The photographer was still there and he said, look, it's not the law around here or anything, but when I tell a chap to clear off, he usually clears off. So clear off. So the photographer said, he was so nice about it, I cleared off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I bet he didn't quite say uh, cleared off, but we know he wasn't very fond of photographers because he said similar uh, in later life. Uh, we've got clips of that uh, recorded. Um, let, let's uh, move away from that story to back to the Express and the uh, pubs reopening on Monday, Anne. Yes, they are, I know, uh, but not quite as you'd imagine. You, you won't be able to sort of crowd around a comfy fireside at the moment, which we could all do with. It's really cold today. Uh, but I take my hat off uh, to the uh, the guys at the Stonehenge pub, near Stonehenge, um, where they've created, because of course we can only go to the pub if we sit outside in the cold. Um, so they've created their own little mini Stonehenge there in the front yard so that they have got socially distanced outdoor seating uh, 
and it's all very COVID safe. And I think it shows true initiative. But I tell you what, at the moment, you'd want to take a cushion with you to sit on because those look like very, very cold stones to have to sit on to enjoy your pint. I'm sure a lot of people won't mind. They'd, they'd sit down in a blizzard to, to be drinking again. Uh, Michael, just uh, finally, uh, the hairdressers also will be open on Monday. Will you be? Have you got an appointment booked in? Not that, I'm well, not saying no, you need it. But, but, I'm not saying you need it. Well, I do. I do. My hair's getting... It's getting a bit like, uh, you know, one of those tragic cases of, of men of a certain age who start growing their hair again and to try and regain past glories of their teenage years. So it's getting to look like that. But I think uh, my barber, George, in Enfield is already all booked up, so it might be a few weeks just yet. But no, this is a story about how, if you grow your hair long enough, you may be able to sell your lockdown locks for a bit of extra cash. Apparently, if you get up to about 12 to 18 inches of good quality, usually blonde hair, so some gentlemen lying alongside their partners, if they're uh, a bit dozy this morning, you've got the TV on, uh, you know, might be tempted to snip uh, snip some hair off and send it off to the, uh, the wig makers. Because there's, That's there's not even 30, funny! It can't say that! Rise in demand for this sort of uh, wigs and hair pieces uh, apparently over the last year. So, yeah, £100 for, for a good uh, snip of hair yeah. there. If, we're not, uh, we're, if, if we're not endorsing what you're suggesting, Michael, just to be absolutely clear for the record.